<clears throat> okay, this is an interview of Minor Lang. It's at the Connecticut Street Armory, Buffalo, New York, Wednesday, June 12, 2002, 10 a.m. The interviewer is Michael Russert. Okay, uh, if you could tell me your full name and when and where you were born, please. Minor Lang, born in Town of Ashford, that's West Valley, New York. And could you tell me about your pre-war -edu pre education? I graduated from high school in, in West Valley Central School. In what year and, did you graduate? In 1941. Okay. Did you have any occupation or work before the war? Yes. I, well, I couldn't get a job out of high school. Every place I go I was too small. I finally got a job at the Buffalo Forge. Well, I worked there for, I don't know, about six months. Well, if you didn't want to work, that was the place to be. <laughs> I'd go to work Monday morning, and Friday night or Saturday, you'd have the same work on the floor as you had on Monday. Ten hours a day, six days a week, except Saturday you could get off in eight hours. Well that didn't set too good to me, I didn't like that, so I went <coughs> home, I was living in Buffalo and I went home to West Valley and my cousin was there and I said let's join the Army. <laughs> now was this before or after Pearl Harbor? This was uh, after Pearl Harbor. How did you hear about Pearl Harbor and what was your reaction to that? Well, <clears throat> I was going to NYA school, if you know what that is. No, could you tell That's us that? National Youth Administration. Oh, okay. That's, well, all them letter jobs and mm -hmm. stuff. But this, this was a school mm -hmm. up at uh, Lima, New York, it's where Robert Wesleyan University used to be. I went there and we never was, had to get, didn't have to get out Sunday mornings. Well, they got everybody out that Sunday morning. They said that Pearl Harbor had been bombed and things were going to change. Well, naturally, they closed the school. I mean, it wasn't that important. Well, the school was, uh, well, it was co-educational, but they taught different things. Like I was in a sheet metal shop and radio. But uh, that, the war ended the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got the job at Buffalo Forge. After the guy that hired me he said, well, no, because I was going back a couple times a week. He said, the reason I didn't hire you was because he was too small. <laughs> but he hired me. After the war, I went back there, different men in the personnel office. Weren't hiring anybody. Well, about then, here comes that fellow that hired me in the first place. And that guy, <laughs> the other guy, he didn't know what to say. He says, oh, this guy come in, he says, when do you want to start? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I worked a while there and didn't was, have a car. What was your react reaction when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, we didn't really know. Of course, we didn't have the communication that they got today, you know, television, you know, none of that. And most of us didn't have a radio at all in the school, except uh, guys like in the radio shop, they had a radio. Mm -hmm. But we, there was a few that left right then to join the service. But I, went home and I finally got a job and like I say, 
I couldn't take that. Ten hours a day, six days a week, doing nothing. So I went up to the old post office building here in Buffalo, and me and my cousin, he's from Springville. There's the 3rd of December in 42. And we had our physicals right then. Report back the 5th. So we did. He had to get his release from a draft board, which was different than mine. Mine was over here on Franklin Street in Buffalo. And his was out in on a Collins, North Collins. And he didn't get his release right away. So I came in by myself, and I thought, well, that guy chickened out on me. <laughs> but he didn't. I went to Fort Niagara. That was the 5th of December. A few days later, here comes Norm. He, and we got why, why did you pick the Army? I don't know. I didn't actually know anybody in the Army. I knew people in the Navy. I had a cousin and a brother-in-law was in the Navy, but I didn't know anyone in the Army, actually. But I, we enlisted in the Coast Artillery, and everybody asked me why Coast Artillery. Well, then one branch didn't mean anything to me, you know. So we Got where, well, can, I was just wondering where you went after Fort Niagara. Did you go up there to train, or was that in the no? Induction that was the induction center. Mm -hmm. and they shipped us out, and this will never happen in our service anymore. Norm came up there a few days behind me, and we shipped out on the same shipment to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, for the mechanized cavalry. There was 18 of us, all enlisted in the coast artillery. So they <laughs> put us in the mechanized cavalry, which wasn't too bad. I liked it. it had good uh, non-coms and officer. The first thing I had any problems, I thought, afraid I'd ever voice my opinion. I'd been in the service, well, about a month and a half, two months. I was on KP. You pull KP a week at a time, which is all right. So I finished up my week, come by the bulletin board and look, KP, Lang. So I went right in the orderly room, first sergeant sat in there, and I said, I'm on KP. <laughs> he said, what's your name? I said, Lang. He said, yeah, you're on KP. I said, I'm just coming off of KP. I said, I think you got more men than that in this thing. I said, if I was going to pull KP, I would have stayed home. <laughs> he said, well, I thought you was from Louisiana, had a bunch of Louisiana Frenchmen. And I don't know if he had it in for him or what. <laughs> he says, well, you won't be on it. And I never pulled KP after that. But then there was one fella, he didn't like the basic training we was getting. And he complained to his uncle, which was a big wheel in the Army. I don't know what a rank he was. So he says, all of us guys can go to the Coast Artillery. There was only two of them stayed in the cavalry. So we got out of the Atlantic Beach, Florida, that's about 20 miles out of Jacksonville. Get down there and, I don't know, it was pretty near midnight, they put us in these, we had these five-man huts. Gosh, I woke up in the morning, sun shining bright and no activity around. Eight o'clock, Reveille. 
I was used to five o'clock <laughs> the other place. But that's the way it was, and it was a nice place. I mean, they was just building this camp. And we took basic training in the coast artillery. What were some of the things you did in basic training in, in coastal artillery? Well, they had uh, <coughs> the coast artillery where we were was the 53rd Coast Artillery. They had these uh, guns. Well, they, they didn't call them guns. There was a 155 rifle. And we, they had uh, emplacements down on the beach for these. We'd go out there and fire these. They had, uh, well, the master gunners would give directions what how or uh, they had a the navy would pull a target behind a ship and you'd fire out well be like 12 15 miles to hit them targets if you could <laughs> I mean, but that i got put in the motor pool uh, truck driver to begin with. Uh, well, it seemed like everything had come up, they'd have me doing it, you know, put on special duty, all this stuff. Well, <clears throat> one time, I don't know what happened, I was on special duty, and it comes Saturday morning, there's a big inspection in the motor pool. Well, I was assigned to a two-and-a-half-ton truck. Well, I wasn't in camp Friday to clean my truck up. All the rest of the guys, they clean it up for me. You know, we're going to fix him. <laughs> so I'm standing by my truck, and here comes the camp commander. He was a bird colonel. He came over and he looked in the, in the engine, had the hoods up, you know. Turned to me, he says, how come you haven't painted this? I said, I just admit that. That's good. He says, you don't paint that. All the rest of the guys painted theirs, and <laughs> they all got gigged but me. But, but their little trick backfired on them. And the company commander, or battery commander, he was a first lieutenant, Charles McClure. In civilian life, before he got in the service, he was a boxer. He fought under the name of the kid from Paducah. He was a little short, and real stocky. And he had the ears to prove that he, was. <laughs> he had cauliflower ears. And he was good. And I'd been driving him in a Jeep. And I had the Jeep in the, getting serviced that day. And they gave me a, we call them a recon. It was a two-seated Dodge. It had just about had a ladder to get up into it. So, and it was one of these vehicles that was just almost impossible to shift unless you knew how to do it. If you could speed shift it, you could shift without grinding the gears. So I'm going to take him downtown for something. And he says, let me drive this. So I give him my trip ticket, and I says, I want to ride in the back seat. I said, I never rode in the back of one of these. <laughs> OK. Pull up to the guard on the gate. He showed the guard the trip ticket and the guard says okay and he starts to pull away and the guard turned around and gave me the nice, snappiest rifle salute you ever saw. <laughs> I don't think that guy even knew that the captain was, or the lieutenant was driving the thing. But he was a good guy and I was coming back from Jacksonville. This is, I got assigned to this special duty job, a courier. 
go back and forth to the headquarters in Jacksonville. That's where the headquarters for the southern sector was. Make two trips a day. Coming back from the one trip, I met a jeep, two army trucks. They were going into Jacksonville. Well, I waved to them. Kept on going. Pretty soon I looked in the mirror, here come a jeep. He's really moving. Pull up alongside of me and pull me over. It was a battery commander. He knew that my cousin was, or he knew that we was cousins. And my cousin was getting shipped out. He said, you want to go with your cousin? I said, no, I'll stay here, I think. So uh, he, at least he thought enough to, I'll give him that much credit. Most generally, they didn't want relation <laughs> in the same outfit. But my cousin, they shipped him to Iceland. And he never had a furlough all the time he was in. And the war got over in Germany. They're loading them on the boat, ship, I should say, in case there's any sailors here. Oh boy, we're going home. Yes, sir. They went to Germany, occupation duty. <laughs> he never got home all the time he was in the service. And he was, in, he was on his fourth year. Never got a furlough. His mother always blamed me for that. <laughs> I don't know why. That got so it, well, after a while you get sick of some of this stuff. So I got a hold of this other friend of mine. He was four or five years older than I was. Let's join the paratroopers. <laughs> okay, we applied to our application to join the paratroopers. Then they sent us to Camp Landing every day for a week. Camp Landing was 60 miles away, see. I don't was know it why. Was it still in Florida? Huh? Was it in Florida? Yeah. It was south of Jacksonville. Anyway, we went every day for a week. And the <clears throat> sergeant major, he worked up in the headquarters, and he was in the same man, uh, five-man hut that I was in. He says, I asked him about it, if they heard anything. He said, well, he says, the colonel come back from leave. He says, nobody's leaving here. Uh, and I think he, I don't know if he knew my name or what, but we was driving these dump trucks, the guys in the motor pool. They'd, the Army had leased these trucks from the, well, there were civilian engineers, Army engineers. And it was hauling coquina shell from St. Augustine to put around the camp, the road it wasn't paved or anything. And we didn't have time to go back to St. Augustine because it was getting like three o'clock in the afternoon. So we're all parked there standing there around this colonel come up. It's the reason you boys can't stay on the road. He pointed over there some tracks. And I looked at him. He says, I don't, can't see why you got to get off the road. Well, I asked him if I could speak to him. He said, yeah. I says, that's my heart. I says, that's an army vehicle. You can see the tire. I said, we got all conventional tread on our trucks. <laughs> 
he looked and got a little red in the face and he says, carry on, boys. <laughs> and I think that's one reason he wouldn't let me go to the paratroopers. Well, I finally, I don't know if they closed that Atlantic Beach or what happened there. But anyway, they shipped the, the whole unit up to Camp Pendleton, Virginia. That's out of Norfolk there. That was a big coast artillery thing. Well, Fort Monroe, too, is where they had that big 16-inch gun. So I was up there, and I got this other friend of mine, let's join the, they had a thing up, anybody want to go to the infantry? Good. So I said, let's do that. So we did. So we got our orders, and they took us to get on a train in Norfolk to go to Blackstone, Virginia, which was only about 90 miles away at the most. Well, they give us a meal ticket. We get up to Blackstone, and I told my friend, I said, oh, I've been in the service long enough to know if they give you a meal ticket, you better use it. So <laughs> we found a restaurant and asked them if they'd take that meal ticket. Yeah. Got all done eating, now we're ready to go back to, in the Army. <laughs> Went back, and there's no trucks there. <clears throat> no Army vehicles at all. So I called up this company that I'm supposed to report to, the 113th Infantry. And uh, he says, are there any trucks down there? He says, supposed to be some trucks down there. I says, no, there ain't nothing here. I haven't seen any. And he says, where are you coming from? <clears throat> I says, Camp Pendleton. Well, he I guess he never heard of Camp Pendleton, Virginia. He thought it was coming from Camp Pendleton, California. <laughs> so he says, "How long have you been on the road?" I said, "Oh, we left about noon." <laughs> I don't know. It it must have didn't set in with him, see. But I never did see him <laughs> to ask him. But after that, we took basic training in the infantry. And. We got a furlough. Everybody sent everybody home. You didn't get any papers. They just send you home. And we'll mail your orders. Well, I got orders to report back to Camp Kilmer. That was a port of embarkation, you know. I went down there and went now, overseas. Is, what state is that one? New Jersey. It's right close to, well, I guess they call it Fort Dix now. It was Camp Dix. That's where we got sent over as replacements. And we landed over in Liverpool, England. And they put us on a train, the little toy trains that they have in England. I don't know how far we went, but the, in distance, but it was near Bath, England, the Warminster Barracks. Well, our Warminster Barracks was a pup tent. <laughs> so we're there, oh, well, not quite a week, and they, load us up in these trains again, go to Southampton. Got on a, one of these Liberty ships. It was manned by English. I don't know why. There wasn't any American sailors, men in that. But anyway, we went from there and we got off, there wasn't any dock or anything. You climbed down these, that rope, I don't know, you've probably seen them hanging over the... And everybody had enough equipment for two men. 
with them enough equipment, you had about 80 pounds. You climbed on that ladder to get in this dock there that took us up to the shore. Could you explain what a dock is for some that may not know? Oh, well, dock is one of these, actually, it's uh, had the same engine as a two and a half ton truck. It was had the front of it went down. When we come to the shore, <clears throat> they go in as far as they could, you know, without getting hung up, and drop the thing down. That's what it was made for. Is to, well, they call it an LCI, Landing Craft Infantry. And that's what it was. As a, they'd take us, then we get up on the beach there. This was after D-Day. What date was this when you arrived in France? Well, it had to be like the last end of July. And we had, they put us in a, what they call a repel depot, replacement depot. What does that mean? For? Well, what would you do at a replacement depot? What well, you didn't do nothing. You just hung around. And when they decide they're going to, this division up here needs 100 men, they just send 100 men. I was in that repel depot for, well, I don't know, a week maybe at the most. And I went to the 28th Infantry Division, 110th Regiment. The 28th, that's the Pennsylvania National Guard unit. The well, they got the keystone as their insignia. The Germans call it the bloody bucket. It was just a red keystone. And I went to that company and I had a good platoon leader. I don't know if he's alive yet or not. I didn't get a Christmas card from him. I've always got a Christmas card from him. But I didn't get one this past year. But he was a good guy. I was his runner. I'd run to headquarters and pick up orders for him and all that stuff. And I come back one day and he's looking at the orders. He said, hey, they want volunteers for a raider platoon. They're going to make a have a platoon for each infantry regiment. So there's three platoons. I said, that sounds good, I'll go. <laughs> he said, you're nuts. I said, I maybe so, but in the end, he wound up the same place I did in a prison camp. But John Edwards, his name was, he was from California. But he wasn't in the same camp I was. Because our camp was all privates, PFCs, sergeants, and you know, all non-commissioned officers were sent to a different camp. But anyway, before that would. I was in this raider platoon, and we used to do a lot of patrol work. We never worked for one company steady. Maybe this company over here needed a a patrol to go out, check what the Germans are doing, what they got, and all that stuff. And that that's what we done. 
So your job was reconnaissance. Reconnaissance. One time, the this one company was surrounded, and a general was in there. General George Davis. He was from Worcester, Massachusetts. We went in there. Was sent in the, the squad that I was in. It just took one squad, and we <clears throat> went through the German lines and get into where this company was and get the general and come back through the German lines. And we got him out. And he was, well, there was this German who was coming back through the German lines and this German got out of the, uh, the he was in a foxhole, and he got out of that foxhole and come up where we was. It was generally ready to shoot. <laughs> so it was supposed to be a don't shoot unless fired upon. But he was ready to <laughs> fire on him. But we got him stopped, and I don't know which one of us gave this German a package of cigarette, and he run jump back in his foxhole when we came on through. But we got him back to this, was a aid station there. Tired, wet, because I hadn't slept, you know, in, well, I'd say two days at least. And we got in, it was in this building where this aid station was, and there was no chairs or anything to sit down. Well, there was a thing here. I climbed up on there and I laid over in there and went to sleep. Come morning, I woke up and I thought, I don't know what was that was. That was where they put all the bloody bandages <laughs> that I was sleeping in. But then we got, they went back, we went back to our, this company where we was. But we used to do a lot of patrol work. And, You didn't do too much uh, fighting at that because you kept from, you was always be a silent patrol, you know. There's a lot of different things and they, we, they pulled us back one time supposed to be a, a rest. Well, they wanted a, somebody to drive a truck. And nobody volunteered, so I said, well, I'll drive a two and a half ton truck. They wanted me to go back to where we'd come from. It was quite a ways. I'm supposed to pick up gas masks. Well, sucks, I don't know where there would be any gas mask because you never, you didn't carry that gas mask. You just tossed it away. Get back up there, ain't no gas mask up there. So I went back. Another day, he asked me if I'd drive this truck, go over and get a load of coal. He said, I'll send two guys with you. Oh, okay. I took two guys was from the same squad that I was in. So we get in this truck and they told me just where to go. We went down there and go up over this mountain. So I get up, clear, clear up this mountain and there's a switchback. You know what a switchback is? No. You While you're going up like this and it's uh, steep, they have to slab the hill, go back this way. Well, a two and a half ton truck don't turn very short, you know. So I finally kept going ahead and backing up and going ahead and backing up. And I finally got around that switchback. Get over there where I'm supposed to go. There ain't no coal over there. 
So we start back, and this friend of mine, he's from New York City, Philip Freed. He let me drive a while. Okay, so we, he's driving down the road, and pretty soon here we come to that switchback. He stopped, I said, what's the matter? He says, I guess you better take it. <laughs> Him and the other guy wouldn't even ride with me <laughs> to get back around that switchback, because if you fell off of that switchback, it was, it was gone. But they wouldn't even ride with me. <laughs> get back to like, company commander. I said, wasn't any coal over there? So he didn't say nothing. But when, before that, I was in the Hurtgen Forest. And that was a rotten place. You couldn't see very far because of the trees And they were shelling, and these bombs would come in, and they'd have what they call a tree burst. It'd hit the tree, and it'd blow. Shrapnel falling down, and I never got hit. My buddy got hit, and I <coughs> took him to, dragged him down to where there was a medic. Medic says, come here, I'll get you all fixed up. I said, I'm not the one that's hurting. He's the guy that's hurting. He said, yeah, but you're the one that's bleeding. That, when that shell hit, the concussion knocked the rifle out of my hand and hit me in the face. Had a bloody nose. And the guy that was in a foxhole, that cured me of foxholes. It killed him, the concussion. Came into that foxhole and it killed him. This lieutenant up at the VA hospital he said, How do you know it? Concussion killed him. I said, There wasn't any holes in him. It had to be concussion. Well, that's all the end of that story. So, But anyway. They, we got out of that Hurtgen Forest. There was this one place that was... Um, How long were you in action there in the Hurtgen Forest? Well, I was up there probably a week. But you never... I didn't know one area from the next. It was all the front line as far as I was concerned. This one time was taking the pillboxes. And these pillboxes, there's a pillbox here. And these pillboxes are overlooking, so that you can see. So there are six infantrymen guarding this tank to go up there to bulldoze his pillboxes shut. What were they made of? The pillboxes? Mm -hmm. Concrete. Concrete and metal. They wouldn't come out, so the only thing you can do is to make sure they can't come out. Well, there's one fella, there's two guys bringing up the rear on this tank and two guys on the sides. They go up and this one guy was just getting ready to go up. Bang. He was yellow, that's what he was. He shot himself in the foot so he wouldn't have to go. I told a friend of mine, I said, it's a good thing that we didn't know that before. He wouldn't have to shoot himself in the foot. He'd have got it himself. Because the way we looked at it, we're supposed to protect him and he's supposed to protect us. And if he ain't gonna protect us, he, he isn't any good to anybody. So, but we got the pillboxes covered up. I don't know. Okay, let's
Okay. Oh. Well, after this, uh, where we was back for this supposedly a while rest, they loaded us up and we went not too far. They put us in the trucks. We didn't have to walk this time. And we went to a, I was, the squad that I was in, they put us with K Company. We we're supposed to do a work for them at Hassingen. That's in Germany. This where we were before was in Konstam. Don't ask me if that was in Germany or Luxembourg or where it was, because they didn't have signs that I could read. Anyway, we're in this. Hossingen, and this company, the squad that I was in, they sent us out, there's a little dirt road that went out in the country, well I'd say it was probably half a mile out of town, this little town. Well, <clears throat> the sergeant, I don't know who he was, I wish I had remembered, I'd have told him what I thought of him. The, he had one of his men and me we had this uh, 30 caliber machine gun. It was one of these that you, the bullets are in a web. You had to feed it. Took two men to run it. You know. Had a box there and one guy's feeding it, and this other guy, he's shooting, and all, it was dusk. You couldn't really make out, but you could see people walking. There was a whole line of them, like, like a squad of men. And said, we better shoot them. So he opened up, and I don't know how many rounds of ammunition we shot. Nobody shows up from this house that was where the sergeant was. He said, we better go back into town and see what's going on. So we went back into town. And the sergeant. I found out later he'd forgot us that we was out there. But I went out that next morning, meeting, well, what was left of my squad, there were six of us. It's just, there was a hotel, supposedly a hotel. But, <clears throat> that, and he just laid down on some beds there. We was down on the first floor. This friend of mine, he said, come on, get up there, shoot, shooting. I said, yeah, I can hear them. I said, they're, they're way up on the third floor. I said, well, when they start getting down lower, I'll get out of here. But anyway, I got up and I thought, well, I'm going up and I'm where I, we was shooting the machine gun. Sure enough, there was that row of dead Germans. But that sergeant never come out to see what was going on or why we was doing all that shooting. That was on a... I don't know what day of the week it was. I couldn't remember days of the week. It was all alike to me. What month of the year was this? In 44. What month? December. December, okay. Cold. Now, were you given winter gear? Did you have your winter well, equipment? Well, we didn't have, all we had was our ODs, mm -hmm. and you had a pair of gloves, and this 
platoon I was in, we never had got any overshoes. We didn't get, I forgot when it was, we changed clothes. We hadn't had a shower in quite some time. And we got in there and I took a shower. And put on a pair of pants of ODs that fit. Then you get another pair that's a little bit too big for you. And you put them on too, see. And then when they got dirty, you'd throw them away. So you had, at least they look clean. <laughs> but uh, when we was captured there, This lieutenant from this K company, I don't know what he, if he was just a platoon leader or what he was. I don't even know what his name was. I don't know, we got our orders. You've probably heard of the yo-yo orders. Yes, but could you explain them for others? That the yo-yo order is an order that no soldier wants to hear. Why oh, why oh, you're on your own. So that means that we aren't getting any supplies of any kind. You're on your own. So they run us out in the, the German, we surrendered. They run us out in the well, open area. Can you explain why you surrendered and how this happened? <clears throat> well, when you get the orders that you're on your own, that means, you're being that means what, what are you going to do? If you haven't got ammunition and very little food, and the Germans had us in this, well, like a cow pasture. Well, all this, when this is all going on, there's a English fighter plane and a German fighter plane. It's having a dogfight right up over us there. Well, we're in this, like a quadrangle thing, they're all bunched up. And here come an English plane that got hit. We lost his engine or whatever. He was heading right for us. He, <coughs> probably thought we were Germans, and he got close enough to see that we weren't Germans. And he veered that plane off just enough. It went over the crest of this knob right there. It wasn't, wasn't 200 yards from us. He hit the ground, that's nothing but a ball of flame. That's, I call that man a hero. Because if he had hit us, it would have been a lot of dead Americans. But they marched, they marched us for two days and two nights. The oh, this was in the Ardennes? Green. No. Part the, of the bulge, though. In the Battle of the Bulge. This was the end mm -hmm. for us, anyway. They marched us for two days and two nights. And we came into a town called Geraldstein. There was a rail head. It was in this, what they call a roundhouse, you know, if they run a, the engine on that merry ground thing and turn it to go back the other way. So we stayed there the next day and they loaded us in these box cars. How were you treated? Were you given any food or anything? No, no. No food, no water. It was in these boxcars for six days. And I don't know how many was in a boxcar, but there wasn't, a, there wasn't room for everybody to sit on the floor. Some had to stand 
and take turns, you know. They didn't give us anything to eat. One day, we was in this one rail yard. See, the POW train didn't have any priority over anything. If there was a supply train going somewhere, why well, that supply train went through, and we sat. One day, they let us out of these boxcars, and there was a pipe coming out of the stone wall. We got a drink of water. That's the only thing we had. But they, then they came around, they said that there was a French prisoner of war camp. It was these Red Cross boxes. Well, what's the French doing with the American Red Cross box? <laughs> we figured that the Germans had these boxes, and they, there was 26, they divide them up, see, 26 men on a one-man box, if you know what a... The box was about this square and about so high. And I haven't seen anybody yet. I've asked lots of people. How you divide a can of sardines 26 ways? <laughs> That's what it was. Everybody stick their finger and that was about it. But the Germans, they had opened these boxes and there'd be like uh, maybe cheese or like a potted meat. They'd, the Germans would take and jab a hole in that can so you couldn't maybe save up and escape sometime. You had to eat it right then or it wouldn't be too long it'd be spoiled. Well, anyway, we went to Bad Orb, Germany. That is near Frankfurt. There are two Frankfurts in Germany. One is up near Berlin, and the other one is down near Nuremberg. Well, that's where we were, down there. I figured we was maybe 50, 70 miles from Nuremberg. That, I, I'm glad that's as close as I got to that place. We went to Stalag 9B. And they interrogated us, one at a time. He went and talked to us, I don't know what he was, some kind of an officer. Ask you this and that. And He asked you where, what outfit was you in and all this stuff. Name, rank, serial number, that's all you would give. It's a little different today. They, they can do something else if you're captured. But at that time, you didn't tell them anything, only your name, rank, and serial number. I don't know, he asked me, must have been half a dozen times. He said, well, you was with the 28th Division, you were doing this and that. He said, well, now we both know. <laughs> he didn't like that. He gave me my, he took my name down, gave me my German dog tag. I don't know if you ever saw one or not. I was going to bring it today, but I forgot it. It's metal, about, about this long this high and it's serrated in the middle. It's got on there IXB, that's 9B, and my number was 26715. I, I carried that in my billfold for I think 35, 40 years. And I started getting bent and I thought well I better not do that. But we didn't get nothing to eat there, really. In the morning, you would get, they called it coffee. I called it 
burned hemlock needles, roasted hemlock needles. It's about what it tasted like. You couldn't drink it. And for dinner, well, most of all this was uh, potatoes. Potatoes about so big around, it's what we used to call cull potatoes back home. Because my dad always saved out the cull potatoes. I says the only difference between them German potatoes and what my dad fed the hogs was my dad used to wash his potatoes. And these, was, I think they just dumped them in, dirt and all. And you were lucky if you got two potatoes that didn't have rotten spots in them. If they had rotten spots, you ate it anyway. And they used to have, at night, you get a loaf of bread, with divide it up into groups. There are six men in a group. And you got this German bread, black bread. I don't know whether it's so, but that we were told that that was made with sawdust. And it had to be six months old for the chemical in there to break down the fiber of the sawdust. But it was kind of sour tasting. Each man would get well, we'd cut it as near as you could, even, six slices. And then I had a deck of cards. I don't know, they wasn't mine, but they was with our group. We used to cut for the first choice. You get an eight years of top choice. But the most generally was cut fairly even. It might make two slices of bread you'd have that we buy in a store today. That's about that was all G I D. And if you got on the wood detail, you used to have to haul this wood back from the woods. To get up in the morning and walk to the woods, and it was snow then. Seven miles out and seven miles back. You get out there, and this wood was cut. I don't know who cut it. It was about, I'd say, five foot lengths in the anywhere from six to eight inches in diameter. Now you carry that for seven miles, you know you've done something. Well, we didn't mess around. We run, went right back to camp. Because if you got back to camp by noon, you had dinner. If you didn't get back by noon, you have dinner the next day. But it, I never know anybody that didn't get their dinner because they always made sure that they got back by noon when they fed. And I always say that that's where McDonald's got their idea of the drive-up window. Now I ate out of my helmet, which I tell people what I'd done with the helmet before. Like if I was pinned down, I use it for a pot. I use it to shave in, wash my feet. And now I'm eating out of it. <laughs> but you walk up to the window, and the guy there, and he'd pick up their three potatoes, throw them in your helmet. Once in a while, they had a what they call a synthetic grits soup. Don't ask me what synthetic grits is. I don't, if it's anything like the grits they have down south, I didn't care for it. But you ate it anyway. 
and we didn't have any sanitary facilities in the camp. There was no running water, no water. We didn't have any water. No heat. The first night when we was there, there was a little bulb hanging down. There was a light. That was the last light we saw. They didn't give us any more lights that night. But, uh, and I've had so many people, they said, was it snowing? Yeah, it's snowing. We snow a foot deep outside. Why didn't you melt snow? He already forgot that I told him we didn't have any heat. I mean, how are you going to melt snow without a fire? They don't, and in one end of the building, they have a big tub. Middle of the night, if you had to go relieve yourself, you'd, if you could make it to the tub, all right. But you can imagine the whole barracks, half of them had dysentery, and stuff like that. And outside, up, out away from the barracks, they had a big hole dug. Pole here and pole here, and a limb between them. That's where you sit to go to the bathroom. No toilet paper. I had a handkerchief. I used that handkerchief all all the time I was in there, getting pretty. Well, you'd let it kind of dry out, and then you'd rub it to get it the dirt off of it. And there was no. If you was sick, you was sick. You didn't. You go on a sick call. They didn't even have an aspirin to give a guy. I never went on a sick call. And they had body lice, something a little fierce. I don't know if you know what the long handles was made out of the, and they had the seams in them. In the daytime, we used to take a, our shirt off and squash them lice in our thumbnails. It was the same thing all over again the next day. When I got out of prison camp, I had holes in my, by my ankles on both sides. But, well, like two inches, all infected. Them scars, I had them for about three years afterwards. What caused that? <clears throat> what caused it? Mm -hmm. Louse bites. And naturally, you know, say you get a mosquito bite, first thing you do is Itching it. And you're itching that, and the first thing you know, you got infection. And then we liberated. Well, Easter Sunday. We figured something was going on because of no guards. Uh, <clears throat> and it come in the morning, Easter Monday, it was, which was April 2nd, the tanks came in. And we were liberated April 2nd. In the American? Troops. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. I don't know what... It seems to me like it was a 707 tank battalion. I don't know. 
they came in. And then pretty soon they brought in some stuff to eat, which was sea rations. I don't know if you know what sea rations were. And you'd eat them, and this lieutenant, he was a doctor. He said, you boys get sick and throw up. He said, don't let it bother you. He said, just go get another can and eat it. <laughs> but that's, I was in the last barracks up on the hill there, and they was taking us to a, well, a delousing station is what it was. And I was on the, one of the last trucks to leave that camp. I was liberated April 2nd. It was the 11th of April before I got out of camp. Went down to the delousing station, take all your clothes off and throw them in a pile. And they had stuff that wasn't new stuff. It was, it was clean. It's what probably some that we'd throwed away earlier. <laughs> they picked it up and washed it. And well, like I say, I was one of the last ones to go through, and the littlest one. I got a pair of size 44 pants and a pair of shoes size 12. I could take three steps before the shoes moved. But then pants, at least they was clean. That's all I cared. And we had a shower. And they sent, I don't think it's C-46s, 47s, I don't know, I'm not a Air Corps man. They brought gasoline up to the front in cans in them planes. And they took us back to Le Havre, well, Camp Lucky Strike. They load us up there. The, the seats are, you know, just folded down from the sides. There's no. At least we got a. They didn't fly so high that you couldn't see nothing. You could see all these bomb craters and stuff. So we went up the, this Camp Lucky Strike. And they had a mess hall set up in some auditorium or a place where we'd eat. They had a band play for us. The first song they played for us, Don't Fence Me In. <laughs> so I'm waiting around, waiting around. Evidently they couldn't get a boat in our ship. So I was there for quite a few days. So I decided I'm going to walk down this little town. So I walked down there and of course there's nothing there was a store there wasn't anything in it. I kept seeing these 78th Division trucks going by. Well my neighbor was in the 78th Division and he'd been uh, as folks got a letter he was missing in action. Well I told my mother I said that don't mean nothing. I said maybe he might be at another outfit or something. They haven't caught up with him yet. So I'm going to find out about him. So <clears throat> I stopped this. Well, there's like a pickup truck. I call him a weapons carrier, a half ton thing, a three quarter ton. Asked the driver, I says, uh, Do you know a guy by the name of Bob Mortz? He says, Where is he from? I says, Western New York. He says, no. He says, well, hop in. He says, I'll take you down to my company. Maybe they can help you out. 
So I get down to his company and he says, you wait here. Pretty soon here come a guy out of that. Wasn't my neighbor that I was looking for, but it was a kid I went to school with in the West Valley. That wouldn't happen again. <laughs> you take one man, you don't know what company is in. You just knew the division, and one man out of the whole division happened to be a friend of mine from home. So I thought that was kind of odd. But he got home and he says, I saw Miner over there, he was just hanging loose. <laughs> yeah. We got on the ship and went to England. I don't know what they had to go to Southampton for. Probably to fuel up or some darn thing. And we I don't know how long it took us. 10, 11 days, something like that. I know it didn't take as long to go home as it did coming over, because coming over there was zigzagging. But we got over there and got off in New York City and they took us down to Dick's, I guess it was. I don't know if it was Dix or Kilmer, one of them. And we had to turn in any, if we had any knives or anything like that, you had to turn that stuff in. I think, because they had German prisoners of war working there. I was afraid there might be some prisoners of war that didn't make it back to Germany when they could. So we, Food there. Then we got a furlough. They give us two months. All prisoners of war got two months free leave. So, <clears throat> anyway, boy, at the end of the two months, I had to report to Lake Placid, New York. I've been home for 60 days. I got to go up there for a rest. <laughs> went up there for a rest. Now, come the weekend, I went home anyway, which isn't too far. Lake Placid is just north of Utica, a ways. So I get back up to Lake Placid Monday morning. Get off the train, here's two MPs, one on each side. Your name Lang, yep. I thought, what the heck did I do now? Of course, I was a little bit late getting back, but not, not enough to send two MPs after me. So I get down to the place where I had to report. Come to find out they had the wrong Lang. <laughs> uh, that was a nice place. But that Kate Smith was up there and saying, had a general give us a big speech, you know, and this and that. You boys are all going to be sent to a army camp nearest your home. That's when I found out that Texas was Closer than I thought it was. That's where they sent me to Texas. But uh, uh, and went to Camp Maxie, Texas, giving basic training to Japanese Americans. And I didn't know from one day to the next. I was a PFC. I might get up in the morning and I might be a squad leader, might be a platoon sergeant, might be able to take the lieutenant's place. As a, I never knew what I was going to do, see. Well, I also was a mail clerk, Joe. He used to be a postmaster in Springville. <laughs> anyway. 
I had a bicycle on my own. I was issued a bicycle to ride to the post office. It ain't like today they got a car to drive. And the main thing, I also had the key to the Coke machine. <laughs> I was a mail clerk, Coke machine, anything had come up. Well, they finally closed that camp. Sent me to Fort Riley, Kansas, in the cavalry. So I'm up there, didn't do nothing. They gave me a room, nicest room. Every day, somebody would come in with a floor polisher and wax the floor every day. Didn't do nothing. Well, I didn't go for that too much. So, right down to the uh, reenlistment office. Went down and re upped. <laughs> they sent me home. I was home for 90 days and I had a report to Indian Town Gap. That's where the headquarters of the 28th Division is. Okay, I get on the Indian Town Gap. Ain't no outfit down there like that. The guy said, well, ain't no outfit like that here. I said, well, you'll have to wait. We'll find out what we're going to do with you. So uh, I was there three, four days, and they finally sent me down to Fort Meade, Maryland. They didn't know what to do with me. So then they finally sent me over to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And that's where I stayed until I got out of the service. And the uh, service, the way I look at it, if you go into the service with a chip on your shoulder, you're not going to make it. You hate it. Well, I like the service, really. I got no kicks. I didn't meet any big wheels. I did down in uh, Florida. They gave me this recon to drive. There's gonna some uh, movie actors and stuff that are gonna go on a bond drive. So this one guy, he gets the regimental commander car, a brand new Ford, see? staff car. And this guy, he's went tall, blonde, curly hair. God's gift of women, he thought. <laughs> we pull up in front of the Mayflower Hotel. I've got this big old ugly recon. So here they come out. It's Ann Savage, I don't know if you ever heard of her, and Lon Chaney. And this God's gift of women, he's got there, got that door open for him. <laughs> She looks up and she saw me down there. She says, I want to ride with him. <laughs> that, I thought that was kind of odd. That guy, his chin dropped just about to the sidewalk. <laughs> but, like I say, the service is what you make it. I kind of liked it. I wouldn't want to go through some of what I did again, but as far as I, I'm here anyway. Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate you redoing this. We'll You're welcome. Good, I hope we, it turns we'll out this time.